Okay, welcome to the last lecture before the Christmas break. And uh, today I want to finish the analytical research on the radon transform. And uh, after the Christmas break, uh, we'll look a little bit at discretization, at realization of the formulas we derived in computer, in real existing tomographs. Okay, um, so last time we derived the two um, inversion formulas for the radon transform. And uh, I want to start by discussing them. So we had row filtered a layer gram, which was this, over, this one over here. And the main things here are first the back projection operator, which integrates over all lines or all hyperplanes that go to one special point. So this is the definition. And uh, the second one was the Ries operator, the Ries potential uh, that uh, uh, in uh, for, uh, for an image function takes uh, the Fourier transform of that function multiplies with the order of uh, the Fourier transform to the n minus one so uh, multiplies f hat of xi by norm of xi to the n minus one and then takes the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, the second one we had was filtered back projection and I already said this is the usually used inversion formula. So up to a factor, that's uh, an inversion working in data, uh, uh, filtering taking place in data space. So we take uh, the Ries operator on the data, meaning we take the Fourier transform of the data with respect to the second variable. And again, everything I do is with respect to the second variable on the data. I multiply with the order to the n minus one, I take the inverse transform, and what I get out is um, the Ries um, filtered version. Now, first thing we should note is uh, what we're doing here is we're taking the Fourier transform, evaluate at some point xi, and then multiply by norm xi to the n minus 1. It's already clear that this cannot be continuous, right? Because um, arbitrarily high uh, values of xi will get multiplied by um, arbitrarily high values of the norm xi of n minus one. So uh, that already means that cannot be continuous, right? There is no limit on this. Okay, so it can't be continuous. Um, and uh, that explains why we're treating it here. It must be an inverse problem because the inversion formula we get is discontinuous or at least part of it is discontinuous at this point. Okay, uh, then what we're doing is we're taking the Fourier transform, multiply with a function, then take the inverse Fourier transform. That's a process we call filtering. And uh, of course, due to the convolution theorem, uh, this is nothing but a convolution. And of course, we will exploit that when we go to the computer and try to implement all this. And this, uh, all of these remarks, um, of course, are valid for both inversion formulas. Okay, let's uh, discuss this in a little bit more detail. And I want to split the discussion in, uh, in, in even dimensions and odd dimensions. And you'll see the reason in a second. And when I say n odd, of course, I'm interested in n equals 3. And for n even, I'm interested in n equals 2. Now, uh, let's take n equals 3 first, because that's the simple case. Short reminder, when we started looking at the Fourier transform in lemma 4.2, we derived some computation rules. And one of these was that uh, the Fourier transform of a derivative of the function can easily be related to the Fourier transform of the function itself. OK, uh, now let's use that for row filtered layer gram. And uh, for n equals 3, we have i to the i, uh, i to the 1 minus n. So that's i to the minus 2 Fourier transform of that. By definition of the Riestron um, potential is nothing but norm of xi squared f hat of xi. Now, norm of xi is xi 1 squared plus xi 2 squared. 
times the Fourier transform of Xi. Now, you know, using that formula over here, I get minus um, second derivative of f with respect to the first variable plus um, um, second, <laughs> second derivative of f with respect to the second variable. Uh, so uh, that's the Laplacian. So this is minus the Fourier transform of the Laplacian of Xi. And taking the inverse Fourier transform, this is nothing but i minus 2f is nothing but minus Laplacian of f. So in fact, that for an odd, um, the Ries operator is a very boring operator because it's nothing but the Laplacian for uh, n equals 3 or Laplacian squared for n equals 5 and so on. OK, uh, so in this case, our reconstruction formula reduces to up to a factor. It's nothing but the back projection of the data and then taking the Laplacian of that and, of course, the Laplacian with respect to x. OK, uh, so all we have to do is back project and take second derivatives. And uh, now let's uh, also look at the same thing for filtered back projection. And uh, well, it's almost the same thing. So uh, in this time, this time we have to um, apply the Ries potential to a data function. So by definition, we have i to the minus one, uh, i to the minus two g of theta and sigma is absolute value of sigma squared g hat of theta times sigma. So uh, this is minus g hat. Again, you're applying our formula minus uh, um, second derivative of g Fourier transform of that of theta and sigma. Now again, taking the inverse Fourier transform, we have that i to the minus 2g is nothing but minus second derivative of g. And of course, again, yeah, with, with respect to the second variable. OK, so uh, in this case, our inversion formula reduces to something that's uh, just as simple as above. So it's up to a factor. It's nothing but the back projection of the second derivative of the data with respect to the second variable. OK, so uh, that's simple and uh, that's great. But the thing is, it works only for n odd, right? Because if n is not odd, uh, then uh, the absolute value over here doesn't cancel. So it stays and uh, the I cannot apply the simple formula that I had above. Um, also, let me note that the radon transform is local in the following sense. What I mean by local is, uh, let's assume that uh, in a computer tomograph, we just want to take picture an image of the heart, then it seems reasonable to only take x-rays that go through the heart, right? I mean, we're not interested in the chest. So why should we um, put a radioactive load on the chest? We should actually block it and uh, just look at the heart itself. Now, uh, is that going to work? Well, if uh, we are in odd dimensions, definitely it's going to work because what we need to reconstruct at one point is uh, we need, need to do the back projection. We need to perform this back projection over here. Now, uh, what do we need? We need the second der derivative at all those planes that actually hit x, right? And uh, of course, to compute the second derivative, I only have to know the second derivative in a small vicinity of that point. So. Um, if I have the data for all rays, uh, not only at the point itself, but also in a very, very small vicinity of the point, then I can actually compute the second der derivative on the data. And of course, then I can do the back projection over here and uh, I'm done, right? So uh, reconstruction is local in that sense. And uh, that's great. I do not have to put extra load on the patient if I'm not interested in the surroundings. OK, and uh, what's of course behind this is uh, that finally uh, the reconstruction in odd dimensions is nothing but back projection of the differential operator of the sec second derivative here. And uh, of course, differentiation is a local operator and back projection is a local operator as well. OK, that's good. Um, now, the only thing I have with that is that uh, we're not interested in n equals 3. 
right? So uh, we're interested in n equals two because we cannot measure planes only in some special cases. You're only uh, you're actually able to measure in planes, but usually you measure on lines. So uh, we have a two-dimensional problem, and we have n equals two. So um, again, this is the interesting case, and uh, of course, the, the what I'm looking at now is the inversion formula that's used in more or less all computerized tomography devices. Okay, um, now let's do the same thing as above. Let's look at I to the and, and I restrict myself to uh, filter back projection here. So um, row filter diagram gives exactly the same result. I look at i to the minus 1g, Fourier transform of that. Uh, now, why is there 1 over 4 pi? Um, I don't see why there's a 1 over 4 pi. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> there are many ways of defining uh, the um, the Ries potential, and I accidentally took the wrong one, which I didn't use. So uh, the definition of i to the minus one g is then absolute value of sigma times g the Fourier transform of theta and uh, theta and sigma with respect to the second variable. I'm going to leave that out now. Um, now, I can write the absolute value of sigma as sine of sigma times sigma times g hat of theta and sigma. And uh, now I can apply my formula from above. So this is nothing but g prime, the Fourier transform of g prime at theta and sigma. And I get an additional factor of minus i over here. And it's red because I always forget it and I forgot it here. Uh, now that doesn't look too good because now we have the sign over here and we cannot easily take the inverse Fourier transform, but fortunately we already did some work and uh, what we have here is nothing but the Fourier transform of the Hunkel transform uh, as we derived it in 4.17. So this is uh, the Hunkel transform of the first derivative of G of theta and S uh, uh, evaluated at some point sigma. Now, of course, I can take again take the inverse Fourier transform that now works. So i to the minus one g is nothing but the Hunkel transform of the derivative of g, and that's of course the reason why we introduced it in four point seventeen. Okay, so in two dimensions for the interesting case, we have that uh, f of x is up to a constant. The back projection of the Hunkel transform of um, g prime evaluated at x times theta. And from the definition of the Hunkel transform, it's exactly what is here. Okay, so what can we see from that? Well, the main thing is, or the first thing is, this is not local. To get the Fourier transform, uh, to get the function value of f at some point, it's not sufficient to uh, to have some local information. But this, uh, the, first of of course, this is uh, the the integral over s one. So we have we need all the values of theta, of course. Well, that's no problem. We had that as well. In, in the first case, but here's the integral over all of R. So we need to know, to, to get to just get the value at one single point, we need to, to have the values of G prime everywhere. So we need G of theta and S for all theta and all this. And uh, so it's definitely not local. And what I proposed above, so if you'd want to take an image of the heart, just look at the heart, that's simply not possible because we need all the data for all the lines that hit the support of F. Okay, um, so that means that, for example, in the case of the heart, roughly 95% of the radioactive load that is put on the patient is actually completely wasted. Note that this is something which is, of course, not true when you just take an x-ray, right? So if you have a one-dimensional projection, that's no problem, right? You can, uh, you, you can just look at the heart and, and that's fine. But for computerized tomography, for taking the tomography of that, for getting a CT, you need all the data in a plane. All you can do in that case is just simple back projection. And uh, you see that you saw that uh, in this case, you get very blurred images. 
Okay, um, so um, I think I already mentioned uh, the fact that uh, the first tomograph was built by Hounsfield. And uh, I have to correct one thing. I think I also said that um, he used or he developed an inversion formula based on special functions. That's not completely true because uh, Cormac was the one who gave the first idea of the tom tomograph. I think some at some point in the 60s, uh, end of 60s, early 70s. And uh, he already developed uh, uh, a nice inversion formula. And uh, because he was not aware of Radon's result, and uh, Hounsfield was the one who several, several years later actually built one device, and uh, that's the one that I mentioned you can actually see in Lenap in the Röntgen Museum. Um, okay, this was, they both of them were awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, 1979, I hope that's correct. And um, let me give you a very rough idea of what their inversion formula looks like. So uh, they have a completely different ansatz. They uh, represent the, um, the function f of x by radial ansatz functions. So um, um, let's, uh, so f of x is the image I would like to reconstruct. Then uh, for every fixed value of the radi of the radius, I um, expand uh, that function into the Fourier series. So I get something like this with a Fourier coefficients depending on the radius. And I do again exactly the same thing for the data. And uh, this time for fixed S, I represent this as a Fourier series again. And of course, I get Fourier uh, coefficients that depend on Yes. Okay, um, now the nice thing about it is that you can get a direct relations between fk and gk. So in fact, what you can do is uh, you can compute fk directly from gk prime. And that's a formula involving Chebyshev polynomials. And uh, let's see, probably you'll prove that in, on the next exercise cheat. Uh, next thing, uh, Röntgen transform or, or X-ray transform. Um, there are equivalent formulas, but as I said, we're not very interested in uh, the Röntgen transform, so I'll skip that. Um, now, finally, what about il postness? Um, you may have been a little bit uh, surprised uh, when I told you that uh, the radon transform is in fact invertible because we've spent quite a lot of time looking at uh, non-invertible um, operators. Um, well, for the radon transform, at least it's injective. And uh, if you look at what, what I proved, then uh, this, is, this is really uh, the thing. I proved that uh, it's, in, uh, it's injective. Um, so it's invertible on its range. But I didn't prove that it's surjective, and it definitely isn't, because in uh, one of the um, exercises, you already proved that a data function is in the range of the radon transform if um, the um, PM of theta defined by this over here, by this uh, formula over here, uh, is a homogeneous polynomial in PM for every m. And uh, what you can prove is that this actually characterizes the range. That's something that was proved by Helgason. So um, the Fourier, so, so the radon transform is invertible on the range. So on all functions that satisfy, on all data functions that satisfy this condition over here. OK, uh, so. Um, well, but in a sense, it's uh, invertible. So is it an improperly posed um, problem? So is the uh, inversion improperly posed? Can we see that from the inversion formula? Well, I already pointed at that. Um, the uh, inversion formulas that for n equals 2 and n, n equals 3 that I just derived, they include the derivative. And for n equals 2, it's, um, it includes the first derivative. 
Um, then it integrates, that's not going to make things worse. So um, we have one derivative, so that, that smells like the, uh, the radon transform is improperly posed of order one, because the uh, first derivative, taking the first derivative is improperly posed of order one. Okay, so something happened to my mouse again. Ah, it's back. Uh, now, um, another way of looking at this is um, Helgason also proved that uh, the singular functions UK of the radon transform are oscillating like e to the ik phi. So um, the row filtered layer gram, for example, takes these e to the ik phi when you take the filter, when you do the filtering step, when you uh, apply the release operator, the release potential. Um, you have something like e to the ik phi times absolute value of chi when k when you think of some discretization. Now, so in the row, so uh, the k singular function gets multiplied in the inversion by uh, absolute value of k. And um, if you remember the um, the formulas we had for the inversion, then this is something like one over sigma k. Uh, which means that the singular values of the Fourier of the um, uh, of the radon transform decay like um, one over k at this all of um, for the excuse me for the um, the uh, for uh, the these operator excuse me, for the these operator decay like one over k. So again, we have a, a maximum um, order of repostness of one. And uh, however, that's not the end of the story. Um, we have an integration after that, and that integration makes things a little bit better. So um, we will, in the next video, we will prove that the degree is actually one half, and that makes for all, all for n equals two. And uh, that will make things even nicer.